The committee hearing is called to order, and I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. I want to welcome uh, everyone to today's hearing entitled Investing in America's Energy Infrastructure, Improving Energy Efficiency, and Creating a Diverse Workforce. This hearing will focus on a series of bills designed to make America's homes, businesses, and energy infrastructure more efficient and cost-effective while also investing in a diverse workforce to build, operate, and manage this infrastructure. Unfortunately, our, colleagues, our colleague, Mr. Welch, had to return to his home state of Vermont and will miss today's hearing. But as we have all, all indicated and as we all know, he has been a strong supporter of the Homes Act and Smart Building Acceleration Act. And he sends his regret in not being able to speak, speak today on those two important measures. Most of the day's bills enjoy bipartisan support. And I would like to thank Ranking Member Upton for working with my office in close parts of HR 2114, the Enhancing State Energy Security Planning and Emergency Preparedness Act. This bill will provide much needed assistance to state energy officers to plan for and respond to energy disruptions from both physical and cyber threats. And I look forward to moving it forward. While I support each of the, each of the bills before us, I want to concentrate my remarks on H.R. 1513, the Blue and Green Collar Jobs Act, which continues to be one of my top priorities. H.R. 1315 is in essence a jobs bill designed to train underserved groups, including women, minorities, veterans, unemployed energy workers, and returning citizens, among others, for the energy jobs and energy careers of the present and the future. Today, marks the second hearing on this important bill, providing an opportunity to hear directly from DOE as my Republican colleagues have repeatedly requested. It is my hope that following this hearing, the minority side will finally accept my repeated offers to work with my office on this bill as we move it through this legislative process process. Despite their refusal to work with me following the first hearing on this bill, my office has made several changes to the bill to strengthen it and to make it much more inclusive. In addition to opening up the grant program for training in nuclear energy and carbon capture and storage, we have also clarified that grant, grant, grants and assistance will be made available to labor unions and qualified youth and conservation corps. We strengthen the reporting requirement and accountability measures for evaluating performance and impact, while also streamlining the definition for underrepresented groups throughout the mill and adding language to prevent the duplication of programs at NEOE, relying on the technical assistance comments that we received from NEOE from both the current and previous administrations, I'm confident that the program established in H.R. 1315 will go a long way in producing actual results in the form of jobs field rather than this 
ceaseless and nonsensical talk and planning uh, that have too often been the norm. It is my hope that following today's hearing, my Republican colleagues will finally agree to discuss actual substance with my office so we can move this much needed bill forward. I look forward to hearing from today's panel of DOE officials on all the bills before us here today. And I would like to call now on my good friend and colleague from my neighboring state of Michigan, Ranking Member Upton, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, my friend and chairman, for holding this hearing on eight Department of Energy Workforce and Efficiency bills. Uh, I am pleased to see that our bill from the last Congress was included, H.R. 2144, the Enhancing State Energy Security Planning and Emergency Preparedness Act. You and I worked together on that bill, and it passed the House by a voice vote. Somehow we got to get it through the Senate. I look forward to seeing this bill get across the finish line in this Congress. And as you know, from our oversight work, our energy infrastructure is comprised of a vast network of energy and electricity delivery systems. These intricate and highly interdependent systems enable almost every aspect of our daily life. The nation's economy, security, and the health and safety of its citizens depends upon the reliable and uninterrupted delivery of fuels and electricity, which is why it is so important to stay on top of maintenance and modernization. And at the same time, we've got to also remain vigilant when it comes to energy security planning and emergency preparedness. Since the inception of the Department of Energy State Energy Program in 1975, the manner in which energy and power is generated, transmitted, and delivered continues to rapidly change and evolve. Recent hurricanes, fires, and cyber-related events have raised real concerns about the security and resiliency of the nation's energy and electricity systems and states have emphasized the need to prioritize energy security, emergency planning, and energy infrastructure protection. H.R. 2144 will indeed modernize and reauthorize DOE's state energy program through 2025. It's a good bill that will help states with the tools to plan and prepare for energy security emergencies. I would encourage all of my co colleagues uh, to support it. We also have a couple other bipartisan bills from the last Congress, H.R. 2019, the Smart Energy and Water Efficiency Act, H.R. 2044, the Smart Building Acceleration Act. These bills will help save energy in public buildings and encourage the adoption of innovative technologies to, in concert, to uh, conserve water in communities across the country. These are good bipartisan bills. I look forward to receiving input from DOE to further perfect them. Unfortunately, we have not had enough time to review some of the other bills before us today because they were introduced just this week and we haven't had the opportunity for background hearings or understandings. I'm also troubled by the fact that the majority has not seemed to take an interest in our offer to make good the workforce bill bipartisan. As we have said, we should return to the original version that was agreed upon. I believe that we can improve the bill and it could pass again with unanimous consent if it were simply all of the above and inclusive of every underrepresented group, including women and veterans. Mr. Chairman, I know that we can return to regular order so that members have the opportunity to make informed judgments about the need for legislation and the effect of these bills. I wanna thank our two witnesses, Assistant Secretary Simmons and Dr. Campos for appearing before us today so that we can learn about DOE's efforts on efficiency in workforce development and determine whether additional legislative authorities are necessary. Given the price tag of these new bills in the tens of billions of dollars, we owe it to the taxpayers and to consumers to take our time to determine whether the spending is justified. I promise to keep an open mind. And as I've said before, we're ready to get to work. If all of us are serious about the effort, I yield back. Max, the chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone who's the chairman of the full committee for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, we're here to discuss legislation that invests in making our nation's infrastructure more energy efficient. This important investment will create good paying jobs, save consumers money, and help us combat climate change by reducing carbon pollution. Countries across the globe are investing in energy efficiency and it's making a difference. 
According to the International Energy Agency, the world would have used 12% more energy in 2016 had it not been for efficiency gains achieved since 2000. And that's comparable to adding another European Union to the global energy market. A critical piece of infrastructure includes making homes, buildings, cities, and manufacturing facilities more energy efficient. Efficiency work supports thousands of good paying jobs at small businesses in every state and weatherizing homes or retrofitting public buildings saves money and supports our efforts to address climate change. The eight bills before us will increase energy efficiency, develop a modern energy workforce, and strengthen energy security. H.R. 2043, the Homeowner Managing Energy Savings or HOMES Act, introduced by Representatives Welch and McKinley, provides cash rebates of up to $5,000 to homeowners for performing retrofits that achieve home energy savings. H.R. 2041, introduced by Representatives Tonko, Chairman Rush, and Representative Kaptur, would also help homeowners save money and create jobs. This bill increases funding for the Department of Energy's Weatherization Assistance Program to $350 million annually and modernizes the program. This technology can also be a driver for increased energy efficiency, and Representatives McNearney, Welch, and Kinzinger have introduced bills that analyze and support new technologies in smart buildings and water systems. The subcommittee, subcommittee will also review two bills that reauthorize grant programs to assist states and local governments in making public infrastructure more energy efficient. Representative Stanton and Vesey introduced H.R. 2088, which increases funding for the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program. This program provides grants to states and local communities to assist their efforts to reduce fossil fuel emissions and conserve energy. And this is something that has been a priority for mayors and local elected officials around the country, in large part because it funds infrastructure that will save those communities money. Similarly, H.R. 2119, introduced by Representative Kelly, increases funding for DOE grants to improve the efficiency of public buildings. Both programs provide critical support to local communities that often lack the resources to take on large-scale public efficiency-related projects. And we should also look at investing in the skilled workers who manufacture equipment and build and operate plants. Chairman Rush's Blue Collar to Green Collar Jobs Development Act establishes a comprehensive nationwide program at DOE to improve education and training for jobs in energy-related industries. And finally, we have H.R. 2114, the Enhancing State Energy Security Planning and Emergency Preparedness Act, introduced by Chairman Rush and Ranking Member Upton. Obviously, this bill is bipartisan and reauthorizes the state energy program at $90 million per year and allows states to use the funds to implement a state energy security plan. The bill passed the House by voice vote during the last Congress, and I'm hopeful that we can get it to the President's desk before the end of this Congress. So again, these, this is a legislative hearing on these bills. We'd like to move these bills. I want to commend the sponsors for their work on these important issues and thank Mr. Simmons for appearing before the committee for the second time this year, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yield oh, just the balance. I yield to the gentleman from yeah. Maryland. I appreciate that. I just wanted to echo your, your comments and say that we have a lot of very strong proposals here in terms of energy, energy efficiency. I want to thank um, Congressman Rush in particular for the Blue Collar to Green Collar Jobs Employment Act in Baltimore, uh, Baltimore City and a number of partners, including originally the Department of Energy here under the Obama administration, but also foundations and businesses, uh, workforce development groups have put together an initiative called Baltimore Shines, which is to install solar panels um, on the homes of low-income and moderate-income residents in Baltimore City. So. There's a positive impact on the bottom line in terms of their utility costs, um, um, reducing those utility costs, also obviously helping reduce the carbon footprint um, when it comes to the environment and, and making sure we're doing the right thing. But also a pipeline, as was alluded to, generally a pipeline for the workforce to move um, to green collar jobs, which um, uh, can really establish somebody and put them on a path to uh, sufficiency. So, uh, thank you for those bills, and thank you, Congressman Rush, for your proposal. I yield back uh, to Congressman Plum. I thank the gentleman. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. And the chair also thanks the gentleman for his kind remarks. The chair now recognizes Mr. Flores, who is uh, in speaking for the ranking member, Mr. Walton, who's not present. The chair recognizes Mr. Flores to read uh, Mr. Walton's statements for five minutes. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing to continue our oversight of the Department of Energy's Energy Efficiency and Workforce Development Programs. I would also like to thank our DOE witnesses, Assistant Secretary Daniel Simmons and Mr. James Campos, for appearing before us today. Uh, Daniel actually testified at our last subcommittee hearing, so we welcome you back for another round of questioning. I hope you feel the same. So. Before I get into the substance of the eight bills before us today, I need to make a point about the regular order and process. As yet another week goes by without a single substantive legislative accomplishments, the Democrats are still struggling with the basic principle of regular order. We're familiar with three of the bills before us today from last Congress, and they are bipartisan, and that's, we are appreciative of that. The rest of these bills, unfortunately, have just been jammed through without regular order. In fact, some of them were just introduced on Monday so that they could be squeezed into this hearing. There were no background hearings held to establish the need for the legislation. There was no technical assistance sought from the Department of Energy. There were no Republicans included in the drafting process at all. This is not regular order, and it is certainly not a process that the Democrats should be proud of. The estimated price tag for all eight bills is a staggering $26 billion. This includes more than a half billion dollars for a green collar jobs program, $15 million for a new energy and water efficiency pilot program, another half billion dollars for energy efficient public buildings, $1.8 billion for weatherization assistance, $1.3 billion for a new home energy savings retrofit rebate program, and last but not least, an astounding $21 billion for energy efficiency block grants. Mr. Chairman, we owe it to our constituents to, and to consumers across the country to give this a much more serious effort. Rather than rushing to authorize tens of billions of dollars in additional spending, we should have real oversight hearings to better understand the needs and to discover if there are gaps that require Congress to provide DOE with additional statutory authorities. With all of these new grant programs for efficiency, we have no idea if they're actually necessary or if they are duplicative or if they are in conflict with other existing programs. Since several of these bills do provide grants to state and local governments, members of this sub subcommittee should hear from those state and local governments directly to identify gaps and to see how the federal government can better support their efforts on energy efficiency and workforce development. Also, since several of these bills revive expired programs, we should gather lessons learned from past experiences before determining whether programs should be reauthorized, and if so, how much we should spend. Unfortunately, at the rate we're going, we are not going to get the opportunity to explore these issues more deeply. As a result, we're going to have partisan bills that pick winners and losers and reward special interest over consumers and over taxpayers. Worse yet, we're going to repeat the mistakes of the past by doubling down on failed efforts from President Obama's Green Jobs Program. Republicans are focused on real solutions to encourage energy efficiency and workforce development. We should not be wasting our time reviving old expired efficiency programs, some of which have not received funding in years. We're ready to work when Democrats are willing to reach across the aisle and to make a serious effort. I'm disappointing that we're starting off this way, but I continue to remain hopeful that we can get back on track. With that, thank you for holding this hearing and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I, I want to respond, but the chairman of the full committee has prevailed uh, upon me to just ignore the comments and uh, continue with the hearing. So uh, wisdom has prevailed, and I'm not going to respond to the other side's comments. So now we'll recognize our witnesses. Uh, our first witness. Uh, today uh, before us is the Honorable Daniel Simmons, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy uh, at the Department of Energy, and the Honorable Mr. James Campos, the Director of the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity at the Department of Energy. And we want to welcome Assistant Secretary Simmons back to the committee and thank both he and Director Campos for joining us today. And we look forward uh, to uh, your testimony. Now, the chairman will now recognize each witness, witness for five minutes 
to remind, provide their opening statement. Before we begin, I would like to explain the lighting system to our witnesses. In front of you, if you're not aware of this, uh, there's a series of lights. The light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining on your opening statement. Please, uh, at that time, begin to wrap up your testimony. The light will turn red when your uh, time uh, expires. Assistant Secretary Simmons, right now you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Department of Energy regarding a number of bills addressing energy efficient energy efficiency issues that are being considered by this committee. One of my top priorities in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy is energy affordability, and cost-effective energy efficiency is an important aspect of overall energy affordability. The United States' approximately 125 million homes and commercial buildings are the single largest energy-consuming sector in the United States, consuming 74 percent of the nation's energy use and over 80 percent at periods of peak demand. There are obviously opportunities for cost-effective energy efficiency improvements in this sector. Today, I would like to share some of the relevant work my office has done and is doing on the areas that these bills address. The HOMES Act would create a program through the Department of Energy to provide rebates to homeowners for achieving home energy savings. Residential buildings use an estimated 21 percent of all energy used in the United States, and 55 percent of the nation's 118 million homes were built before 1980, meaning that there is a lot of opportunities for energy-efficient retrofits. In EERE, we are initiating research to develop better solutions for achieving cost-effective energy efficiency savings through advancements in building construction technologies, less intrusive installation methods, and more effective integrated envelope and heating cooling technologies. To me, this is somewhat personal in that as someone who lives in a home built in 1948, um, it's something I think about a lot, especially when staff comes and talks about building technologies. So there is there's definitely opportunities in terms of energy efficient retrofits. We also uh, implement a variety of programs that promote residential energy efficiency, including the Home Performance with Energy Star program, which works with EPA and local sponsors. So far, the Home Performance with Energy Star program has uh, program partners have reported completing improvements to nearly 700,000 homes. Additionally, EERE's Weatherization Assistance Program developed and maintains foundational workforce training and certification programs to ensure the work is performed in residential uh, weatherization retrofits for low-income homes. The Smart Building Acceleration Act would take a number of actions related to evaluating and advancing the, the current state of smart buildings in the private and federal sectors. Because buildings consume 74 percent of, of electricity generation, the Building Technology Office is working with national labs, private sector partners, and others to examine grid flexibility through greater uh, and better building control and communication technology. We believe there is an opportunity for smart building technology to improve energy integration and storage options for both building owners and grid operators. We also recognize the importance of cybersecurity being built in from the very beginning of, of these projects. Also, I should note that EERE's Federal Energy Management Program works closely with other federal agencies to improve the energy efficiency and smartness of federal buildings. The Weatherization Enhancement and Local Energy Efficiency Investment and Accountability Act would reauthorize the Weatherization Assistance Program through 2024. The President's budget requests no funding for the, uh, for the weatherization um, for WAP and the State Energy Program. DOE understands the congressional interest in these programs and will continue to manage them consistent with statute. The Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Bill expands the purpose of the Energy Efficiency and Conservation and conservation block grant program to include diversifying energy supplies, including facilitating and promoting the use of alternative fuels, and reauthorizes the program at $3.5 billion annually from 20, uh, 2020 through 2025. The Improving Energy Efficiency in Public Buildings Bill would, au would authorize grants for improving energy efficiency in public buildings at $100 million annually from 2021 to 2025. The 
Smart Energy and Water Efficiency Act would, gr would award grants to eligible entities to demonstrate advanced and innovative technology-based solutions to improve the energy efficiency of water, wastewater, and water reuse systems. DOE is implementing a number of, uh, number of initiatives to promote affordable, efficient, and secure water supplies. One effort is the Water Security Grant Challenge, focusing on improving desalination, uh, produced water from, from oil and gas, as well as some uh, nuclear um, mining, a resource recovery from wastewater, the use of cooling, reducing the use of cooling water at thermoelectric plants, and improving small modular energy systems, uh, energy and water systems for urban, rural, tribal, national security, and, and disaster response settings. The Advanced Manufacturing Office works with water utilities and other industrial partners to improve their energy and water efficiency through efforts such as the Voluntary Recognition Program, Better Plants, or Better Buildings, Better Plants. Also, EERE's Weatherization and Intergovernmental Program Office provides technical assistance that, focus, that focuses specifically on the efficiency of wastewater treatment facilities, including WIP Sustainable Wastewater Infrastructure of the Future Accelerator. Mr. Thank Secretary, you. when you this bring is, your remarks. This is it. This is the last line. Thank you for the opportunity to, to appear before the <laughs> subcommittee and discuss these important energy efficiency issues. Timing. I look forward to your questions. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Campos for five minutes for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you. Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee, it's a privilege and honor to serve at the Department of Energy, an energy tasked with, among other important responsibilities, managing the department's 17 national laboratories. Campos, will you pull Can you hear your, your microphone? Can you hear me a little better? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. So uh, again, uh, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee, it's a privilege and honor to serve at the Department of Energy and energy tasked with, among other important responsibilities, managing the department's 17 national laboratories, supporting early state, uh, stage energy R&D across a wide range of science and engineering disciplines, managing the nation's nuclear weapons, and working effectively with states on our nation's energy challenges. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the department regarding legislation pertinent to the DOE. EDI's mission is broad and diverse, with a number of programs and initiatives that focus on meeting its statutory obligations and enhancing the value of the OE's mission. EDI's programs and initiatives are focused on businesses and, its, and its, uh, education to establish critical linkages among minority-serving institutions, minority businesses, and federal agencies to address economic development in underserved communities and to support energy workforce development. ED is committed to increasing efforts for supporting greater inclusion of underserved minority populations. African American, Hispanic, Native American, Asian American, and Pacific Islander, Puerto Rican, and Alaskan Native. Including women, veterans, and formerly incarcerated persons into science, technology, engineering, mathematic fields, and energy-related industries. As Deputy Secretary Bouillette assured the chairman during his hearing before this, uh, this committee, in January of 2018, ET, uh, ED has recently reinvigorated the Minorities in Energy Initiative, now being called Equity in Energy. The program is twofold with external and internal engagements. For external engagement, ED is conducting listening sessions across the country with underrepresented groups to share insights and ideas to increase minority representation in the energy sector. Um, and share ideas to increase my nerves, sorry, in the energy sector. For internal engagement, ED is working with all the departments, program offices, and the national laboratories to bring awareness to these issues and address potential solutions. The Equity and Energy Initiative focuses on STEM aptitudes, supplier diversity, technical assistance, and workforce development. ED also administers the Minority Educational Institution Student Partnership Program, MESEP, which provides students with summer internships at the DC headquarters and the 17 national labs. Since 2005, over 650 interns from minority serving educational institutions have participated in the program. DOE has provided over 700 million to support historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, and other minority serving institutions through research and development programs. In fact, my office was able to partner with and provide financial assistance to several HBCUs and MSIs this year to promote STEM and energy related fields. To further these efforts, ED is working to release a funding opportunity announcement this fiscal year. 
Additionally, I am the department's White House initiative designee to promote excellence and innovation HBCUs. In this role, I lead the economic development and competitiveness cluster and collaborate with the departments of Treasury, Housing and Urban Development, Education, Commerce, Agriculture, as well as the Small Business Administration. The cluster aims to engage the nation's HBCUs to develop workforce and community investment partnerships. With respect to this proposed legislation, please note that the Department has provided the committee with technical assistance in reviewing the bill and will continue to work with the committee as the legislation being discussed today is advanced. Thank you again for this opportunity to be here today. It's an honor and privilege to serve in this capacity. The Department appreciates the ongoing bipartisan efforts, bipartisan efforts to address our nation's energy challenges, and I look forward to addressing any questions. Thank you, Chairman. I want, want to thank the gentleman. I want to thank all of our witnesses. Uh, members, we have a vote on the floor. It's been called, and it is my intention to recess uh, the subcommittee until immediately after the votes. So uh, at this point in time, I uh, want to ask our witnesses if they would uh, remain with us. We should be about 45 minutes to an hour. So uh, we will reconvene immediately after the last vote. Thank you, and the subcommittee stands uh, recessed.
Uh, we have concluded with the opening statements, and now we'll move to members' questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of the witnesses, and I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Director Campos, as you know, the issue of increasing opportunities for minorities and other underserved groups is very important to me. It is an issue that I've devoted my entire career in public service to, and it's one that I continue to hold on as a top priority as chairman of this subcommittee. That's the reason why I worked so closely with Secretary Moniz in the previous administration on increasing the Minorities in Energy Initiative and why I re reintroduced my workforce bill. And I understand that every president has a prerogative to focus on their own priorities. And we all certainly understand that the current president uh, feels a certain way about minorities and about diversity. It's his uh, prerogatives to feel no matter and which he feels. However, the point of both the Minorities and Energy Initiative, as well as my workforce bill, is that it really shouldn't matter who is in the White House, uh, that the agency, DOE, has the affirmative responsibility to work on increasing opportunities for all. DOE is one of the largest agencies in the federal government, and it receives more taxpayer funding, $30 billion of taxpayer money, uh, than any department outside of the Pentagon. It should be in the agency uh, that is the forefront of all the agencies to create opportunities and to use this resources to benefit all Americans, not simply ones who are already a part of the GOB, the Good Old Boys Network, uh, but all Americans. DOE controls billions of taxpayer dollars in contracts, loan guarantees, and funding to schools. Yet, in each and every meeting I've held with agency officials, whether discussing overall contracting dollars or funding to the minority service institutions or minority contractors as part of the Federal Energy Management Program, FEMA, or vending opportunities with the 17 national laboratories of our nation. It's really disheartening to me to hear the same exact excuse. Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Rush, the numbers, and I'm quoting them now, the numbers are not as good as they should be. We need to do more, the end of quote. Director Campos, while I appreciate your traveling around on, quote, listening tours, end of quote, my objective is to get beyond the talking and the planning stages and to offer concrete, impactful policies and procedures that will help benefit all segments of our population. Previously under the Department of Energy Regulation, the DEAR near, there were a diversity clause that overall, they govern all contractors, including management and operating, or M and O contractors. This required a diversity plan that includes educational outreach 
community outreach, and economic development opportunities through technology transfer with the lab. The purpose of the diversity plan was to encourage and foster relationships with minority serving institutions and to develop strategic partnerships with professional and scientific organizations to promote careers in STEM education. The objective of these plans was to create minority participation in contracting and subcontracting opportunities, research and development partnerships, and mentor protege responsive relationships, all of which are central to the objectives of HR 1315. The rest of campus, I'm not going to ask you if your office is working on any type of plan like this, because we both already know the answer. But I will be submitting some questions for the record to your department, and I will also be bringing up this issue when Secretary Perry comes for this subcommittee next month to discuss the OE's project. Let's get to work, Director Campbell, on these issues so that we can start enacting serious proposals such as my workforce bill in order to address some of the disparities and how the agency does back business. With that, I uh, yield back. And um, now I recognize my good friend, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes uh, for the purpose of asking questions of our witnesses. Well, thank you, my friend and, and chairman. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, we do have a number of uh, concerns, uh, particularly as we look at the total price tag of nearly $26 billion. Uh, that ought to get everybody's attention. And as I said, a couple of the bills were introduced just in the last couple of days as recently as Monday. I got just a couple of questions and would just note that we just finished votes on the House floor. We've got another subcommittee that's working. We've got members on, on both. And it's we have, we have uh, because of the Democratic retreat, we've got no more votes, uh, the balance of the week. So folks are off to the races uh, in a variety of ways. Um, has the department been asked for their input and have you supplied any technical assistance, TA, for, for any of these bills? We, we have been asked for, um, for technical assistance on Representative Tonko's bill. Um, I don't know if we have the, uh, we, we have not uh, given that assistance back. I believe that there was a new bill, a version of that bill earlier this week. Uh, in the case of the workforce bill, which I understand you also submitted technical assistance, has there been any response back to the concerns that you might have raised or comments? I'm, I'm not sure. Are you aware of? Not, not that I'm aware of, but I, I'm not sure where we are in that process. Will you commit to working with us to provide a full audit of the workforce activities before the, hopefully before the bill moves forward? Sure thing. Uh, and in the case of the reauthorization of expired programs, uh, can you commit to providing any and all reports and materials related to those programs before these bills hopefully move forward as well? Yes. Uh, I'd also note that uh, I understand DOE's position on the state energy program. Uh, the administration budget request, I think, was zero for the funds uh, or for the program. Uh, Despite the expired program, I know that we in the Congress and the President signed $55 million uh, for fiscal year 2019 for the state energy programs, in large part because the states do ask for it. Uh, do you have any sense in terms of where, can, can you help us? If, if Congress provides the money again, are you going to be able to help us? Oh, with a, with, without a doubt. We will, we will execute on those, those monies as quickly as we can. And uh, I guess the last question that I have is uh, DOE does have an important role to provide technical assistance and coordination to support the states in their efforts to plan and respond to emergencies, uh, especially if there are impacts to energy supplies. We have this terrible storm hitting the Midwest right now and coming this way, you know, hurricane season, you know, that never goes away. Uh, uh, what can we do to strengthen DOE's ability to protect the nation's energy supplies uh, during these emergencies. This, this morning, I know in the, some of the national news, they talked about perhaps widespread power outages that are going to impact the, the plains and some of the Midwest with the storm that's coming through. Uh, what more can we do as we try to work in a bipartisan basis to, to help strengthen the state's role to prepare for these emergencies? So 
I, I don't have uh, I don't have some great answers for that. However, the the two offices that are really focused on those activities is the Office of Electricity as well as the uh, Office of uh, Cybersecurity, Emerg uh, Energy Security, and Emergency Response. Assistant Secretary Walker and Evans are very much focused on. Um, on, on those activities and making sure that the grid is more, uh, can become more resilient, um, and especially focusing on uh, kind of some of the knock-on effects once there is one problem, understanding the entire system so that we can have an energy system that is, that is more resilient and that is hardened from what it is today. So um, we are, um, especially in, in, in QFRs, um, but I know that those offices would be happy to talk with the committee at any time in, in uh, uh, to provide uh, comments. Maybe one last question. Um, so as you look at the 50 states and the, and the territories, is there any state that really stands above others? And is there any state or territory that's really needs, needs some help? Um, I, I don't have a good comment on that, but I, uh, I'll, I'll take that back and find, uh, and find some good examples. Just know, because we've got members from you know a lot of states here on, on this committee, I know that we'd like to, to help, um, particularly as it impacts uh, those constituents uh, wherever they may be. And I uh, would again commend Chairman Rush and others. Uh, a couple years ago, a number of us went down to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands uh, to see what happened because of the terrible hurricane there. So uh, with that, uh, I yield back. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, gentlemen. Now, the chair recognizes Mr. No O'Halloran from uh, Arizona for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Upton for uh, convening today's important legislative hearing on energy efficiency legislation that could not be more timely. Deploying energy efficiency technologies and supporting such programs is critical to conserving our precious energy resources and essential bringing real cost savings to Arizonans and Americans throughout my district. As Arizona continues to find ways to integrate wind, hydro, and solar energy into our grid, I look forward to introducing legislation in this Congress to help our electrical grids make more resilient and efficient. For a recent Southwest Energy Efficiency Project study, Arizona has an energy savings po potential of 21% and potential water savings of 4.1 billion gallons per year if certain efficiency programs are in place. Uh, Mr. Campos, uh, in your testimony, uh, you highlighted the uh, Equity in Energy Initiative. You run within the DOE to promote ethnic representation in the workforce. Could you provide a quick update on the listening sessions your office has had with tribal communities? Sure, Congressman, thank you. We have uh, just started this initiative about uh, three months ago, and one of our first actually listening sessions was at a conference uh, called RES, which deals with uh, most of the Native American tribes across the nation. It was a reductive uh, session, um, and we, we sat there and listened on areas of STEM aptitude and supplier diversity. And went well. What we're what we're doing now is compiling all the information, visiting uh, other states, also doing an event in Tulsa with Native Americans, and figuring out what is their exact heartburn within this process and how we can progress forward in a both efficient and sustainable manner. I, I would uh, suggest that you come to Arizona. We have a large number of tribes there. The Navajo Nation is the largest uh, tribal nation in this country and within my district, and uh, we do have some unique problems there. So thank you for your, your answer. Uh, as we discussed back in February, I believe the Blue Collar, collar in Green Jobs Act um, has the potential to help increase and diversify our energy workforce by providing funding for transmitting energy workers, transitioning energy workers to learn new eff energy efficient trades. How would HR 1315 help Native Americans increase their representation in the energy efficiency workforce. Mr. Campos. Thank you, Congressman. Um, any assistance within the workforce development range helps out all the minority sectors across the country, uh, be it Native Americans, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans. So the, the resources we put forth equally and distributed in, in a manner in which 
uh, is appropriate. As you know, uh, my district is home to four coal generation power plants, including the Navajo Generation Station. Recognizing the many challenges coal-fired power plants are facing across the country and remaining open, I have a keen interest in the economic and societal impacts coal plant closures have on local communities. Mr. Compost, does, does DOE view Section 201 of HR 1315 and its ability to help displaced coal workers transition to new energy efficiency jobs with good living wages? Congressman, um, that's probably a, a question I'll have to get back to you on uh, to make sure that I'm given the right information. Uh, Mr. Simmons, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, about H.R. 2114, the Enhancing State Energy Security Planning and Energy Preparedness Act of 2019. In the last month, there have been some documented fuel shortages in central Arizona, causing a 30 cent per gallon increase at the pump. Would this legislation help states develop state energy security plans to prevent future lapses in fuel such as this? Well, it, it, it would all come down to how good the, the, uh, the state energy security plan is, but it, there is certain, um, hopefully, that I think that that, is, that, that would be the, uh, the goal to be able to look at some of those challenges that, uh, um, especially foreseeable challenges that may happen in situations like that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I applaud the committee's uh, work and to discuss these issues uh, in a bipartisan fashion on this and other issues as this Congress moves forward and I yield back. The gentleman from Union Bank, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Lado, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for today's uh, hearing, and uh, thanks for our witnesses for being with us today. Uh, Mr. Under uh, Assistant Secretary, uh, when reading your testimony, uh, uh, you have uh, an area you were talking about the cybersecurity that you're building, you want to see built into the design, production, and employment of new technologies. And I know my friend from California, Mr. McNerney, and I have worked together on issues on cybersecurity and also on uh, CyberSense and also the grid and the resiliency there. I'm just kind of interested in when you're looking at uh, what you want to do in, on, the, on cyber resilience for all the manufacturing supply chain, could you go into that? What you're looking at? Sure. Well, there's a um, th there's a there's a number of things. Um, first of all, we recently announced uh, cybersecurity and energy efficient uh, manufacturing, which is a new, um, I think, seventy million dollar effort to to look at um, the future of manufacturing in the United States. And the future of manufacturing uh, is likely to be much more automated than it is today. And as we are thinking about new automation, that new automation will increase energy efficiency, hopefully. Um, however, new automation creates new, um, new areas for attack. And so we want to make sure is that as we are, uh, from the very beginning, looking at any opportunities to make, uh, to make new automation more cyber secure, automation and controls, so that they are more cyber secure from the very beginning. Um, the Department of Defense um, also has a, uh, a program in uh, energy efficiency of, of manufacturing. They're focused on existing manufacturing. And as uh, the, the cybersecurity and energy efficiency manufacturing um, FOA that we recently put out, we will work uh, very closely with DOD to make sure that, uh, that their uh, comments and insights are considered as we move forward. Well, let me follow up then, because when you're talking, because like in my district, I've got 60,000 manufacturing jobs. And when I've been out in my district extensively and uh, is, you know, with the automation that's going on and also, uh, Mr. Welch and I, who uh, from this committee, uh, we did the uh, Internet of Things working group two Congresses ago. And what we're seeing out there in the, with all of the different technologies going, how do you work with the companies out there or the manufacturers or the innovators to make sure that they're building this in? And also at the same time, making sure that what they're putting into the product is secure to begin with, that they're not getting it from an insecure source that might have you know, something in there that could uh, enable a cyber attack. So the, on that, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, the, the cybersecurity energy efficiency manufacturing is a new effort, so I uh, don't have any stories to tell about that. Uh, however, there are, um, both our op the Office of Electricity, when dealing with the bulk power grid, 
is very much focused on the issue in terms of cybersecurity of, uh, of the systems that control the bulk power grid, and also the uh, cybersecurity, energy, uh, energy security, and uh, emergency uh, response uh, office in DOE is focused on those issues, and I can get you some comments about, about their work and how, um, how we are working to improve that cybersecurity. Also, um, a real asset for the country is the work that um, happens at the national labs in terms of cybersecurity at places such as Sandia National Lab, Idaho National Lab, Pacific Northwest National Lab, um, and looking at um, ways to, uh, to improve um, cybersecurity. And they reach out to the private sector um, to make sure that they are that they are coordinating and uh, making sure that best practices are followed, as well as um, trying to understand where uh, what cybersecurity issues we are seeing today, so that we can make um, improvements. Thank you, uh, Mr. Campos. In my uh, remaining minute, uh, how much does the Department of Energy spend on the annual basis on a, on an annual basis on the workforce development initiatives? Thank you, Senator. Our budget within my office, in particular, um, economic development diversity, we have a $10 million budget, and a fraction, fractions of it go across the spectrum. And what I mean by that is workforce development is woven in throughout my budget. Uh, about 5.8 million of it is for the actual labor uh, staffing, and then the rest is divided amongst all the initiatives. So, but workforce development is woven in within the whole, within the remaining budget. And, and if I may, there are other, there are some things that my office does in terms of workforce development, um, both the advanced manufacturing office, the weatherization, uh, inter, um, the weatherization assistance program works on workforce development through uh, improving training. Um, there, there's a number of opportunities. There's a number of things that we are currently doing. We'd have to get you a, 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 a holistic DOE number from across the entire enterprise. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired and I yield back. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Tucker, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. Secretary Simmons, I agree that energy affordability should be a top priority. Uh, Low-income households pay, on average, 7.2 percent of household income on utilities. I've seen even higher numbers than that, more than three times the amount that higher-income households uh, pay. And uh, according to the Energy Information Administration, one in three U.S. households faces uh, challenges or face challenges in uh, paying energy bills in 2015. Last week when we debated H.R. 9, a number of members raised concerns about the cost of energy, and I believe they are sincere about wanting to keep expenses down. So today I want to offer at least a partial solution on how to help lower utility bills for low-income families. Uh, Mr. Secretary, why do you think low-income households pay a disproportionate amount uh, in their utility bills? A, a disproportionate amount of their income in the utility bills? Yes, they do. But why do you think that's the case? Uh, because energy is, a, energy is a necessity. But in terms of relative scale to more affluent households, why would their wedge of the pie for energy be disproportionately larger? Well, for one, they, they have less discretionary impact, uh, uh, income, and so when you are um, looking at the most important bills that you pay, um, you have to pay to keep your house warm or cool, you have to pay to keep the lights on, you have to pay to get from uh, point A to point B. Um, like, there, there's no way around those things. Right. So, I would suggest also that they live in inefficient homes with poor insulation and perhaps old windows, et cetera. Uh, unfortunately, many of these households cannot afford the upfront cost of a retrofit, even when it is for cost-effective efficiency improvements. Luckily, DOE's weatherization assistance program has more than a 40-year track record of making homes safer, healthier, and more energy efficient. The program has provided assistance to more than 7.4 million low-income households since that uh, beginning date of 1976. So, Mr. Secretary, do you think weatherization assistance provides a positive service to many of America's most vulnerable households, struggling families, seniors on fixed incomes, and the disabled, for, for instance? Yes. Um, despite the program's success, I believe aspects of the program can be modernized and improved. A lot has changed in 40 years. There are new and emerging technologies and techniques to deliver even more effective services. So, Mr. Secretary, do you believe weatherization assistance should be able to include the latest cost-effective technologies and services to achieve the program's goals? 
Um, yes. Okay, and Mr. Secretary, many of my colleagues have talked about needing to put innovation at the forefront of our energy policy. Today, weatherization funding is provided to states based on a formula. H.R. 2041 would create a small competitive grant program as a set-aside to that funding to support innovative weatherization practices. Mr. Secretary, do you support fostering more innovation in traditional weatherization services? We, we very much foster, we very much support innovation because um, at the end of the day, what matters is reducing people's energy bills and that with the weatherization program. Thank you very much. And the most recent authorization of the program expired in 2012. That authorization was for $1.4 billion, a level we have never reached in a sustained way. This bill includes a reauthorization at $350 million. Secretary Simmons, does the administration generally like to see programs reauthorized at levels better aligned with actual funding? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed part of that question. Sure. Does the administration generally like to see programs reauthorized at levels better aligned with actual funding? I, I don't think the administration has taken a position on that question. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, this committee's responsibility should be to reauthorize effective programs. I think it is clear that the Weatherization Assistance Program, with its record of supporting efficiency for low-income households, deserves to be reauthorized and modernized. And Mr. Chairman, thank you again for holding this hearing. I would also voice my support for EECBG reauthorization, which the Environment Subcommittee heard from a bipartisan group of mayors, provides the flexible resources to advance local energy agendas. And um, with that, I will yield back. For yielding, the chair now recognizes my friend from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess what I'm going to need from you all is um, are some dates, and I don't think you're going to be able to answer initially where they are, so you have to get back to me on it. But uh, I'd like to have, with the weatherization program, uh, and I, I thank the chairman for sponsoring this. Uh, I'm one of the authors or the sponsors of the HOME program. Uh, so it's something very sensitive and why we need to be moving on it. And I appreciate this. So the questions that were asked about uh, why they, the poor are uh, disproportionately affected. So I want to go to the a line of, of re questioning, uh, especially if, as it relates, there were, have been articles in, about Pennsylvania. Um, uh, not being able, not spending the money that was authorized for them. So, uh, and, I, and it was something about $5.4 million. Pennsylvania had, we had provided Pennsylvania to help out the poor, and they didn't do it. And the money had to be returned. So my question in, in three parts. One is, do you have, can you get me or our office a list of all the states when they established a program to do weatherization. Can I support for that? Uh, you get that? Yes, uh, secondly, we'll I'd, I'd like to know when each of those 50 states, and perhaps territories that would come into play, when did they cut their first check? Okay. To see that they are complying with what we're trying to reach out and help people but maybe it's your bureaucracy or something is holding it back and they're, they're not helping out what we're trying to do to help out on that. Okay. And, and thirdly, I'd like to know at the expiration date, how much money is being returned to the federal government that the states are not okay. dispensing? And, and with it, so with that, because I'm, I'm, I'm hearing stories, because uh, we've talked a lot about this in West Virginia, uh, trying to help out folks that sometimes in other states uh, they get the money, the work is done, but they may be six months to a year before the contractor is reimbursed. Uh, that's a, maybe the fourth aspect of it is, is there any justification way that, that people can, the contractors are, should be put in that position? I, don't, I wouldn't think that you would, you would agree that they should be, it should be a year before they're paid, do you? No, no. So it looked like you want to say a little bit more on that. I, would, I was just going to say that, um, you know, we, the, uh, we work very hard. The, uh, we work very hard to make sure that the monies that get appropriated under that program go out to the states in a timely fashion. Um, and we would hope that that money gets then spent by the states in a timely fashion as well. But, but you're aware that 
it may, it's not so much a problem with Washington. We have enough problems here. But it looks like the states are not pushing it down to where it needs to be, and particularly to help the poor in getting their homes, their efficiency. This, this article about Pennsylvania is very disturbing uh, that was put out, uh, and I, I hope that we can kind of put that to rest. So if you get back to us in a timely fashion, the, the three aspects, when were the states established, when did they cut the first check, and how much money did they return to the federal government that wasn't allocated to help out? Okay, we'll do yeah. that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chair, thanks to the gentleman for yielding back. The chair now recognizes my friend from uh, the great state of Illinois, Ms. Kelly, for five minutes. That's right. Wait. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And also, I uh, was wondering the report that Mr. McKinley asked for. Can the committee have that report of the states? Yeah. Ms. McKinley, will you share that, your report that you mentioned with the uh, chair and he can send it to the rest of the committee? All right. Thank Go you. On, all right. Thank you, Chairman Rush. Today's hearing is an important opportunity for the committee to review several pieces of legislation that increase energy efficiency and build a new energy workforce. Thanks for being here. I have introduced H.R. 2119, which amends the Energy Policy Act of 2005 to increase the authorization for a grant program that was set up to, to provide grants for states to improve the energy efficiency of public buildings and facilities. States and local communities often lack the financial resources to undertake large-scale efficiency retrofits for public buildings. This grant program makes it easier for states to make these investments, which in turn lowers the utility bills for the community operating the building. Assistant Secretary Simmons, in your testimony, you discussed the fact that homes and commercial buildings are the largest energy-consuming sector in the U.S. What more can DOE's Building Technologies Office be doing to support state and local communities who may lack the resources to retrofit public buildings? Uh, one of the first things that we can be doing is uh, providing um, technical assistance. Um, and some of that technical, currently we provide technical assistance to the federal government through the Federal Energy Management Program. Um, and there, there, there could be opportunities there to provide that type of uh, assistance at the, at the local level. Um, and as well as some of the work that we are doing in the, the, the building technology office is um, expanding the state of the art about retrofit since there are a lot of public buildings and wanting to make sure that, uh, that there are more cost effective, easier to do uh, retrofit options to reduce the, uh, the energy footprint of uh, uh, government at all levels from the federal down to the local level. You also indicated that DOE shouldn't focus on grant programs like this that could be more appropriately left to the private sector. In what scenario would the private sector step in to fund efficiency upgrades at publicly operated buildings? So one way that that, that, that occurs currently is through energy savings performance contracting, um, where that happens at, at the federal level, but also at the, at the state and local level. Um, and I, I believe that that is, a, that is an area that, that some uh, people in that community, some companies in that community, see as a real opportunity for the future to work with schools, hospitals, um, and other public buildings to, uh, uh, to, um, to do one way of, of improving the energy efficiency of those buildings. I won't ask you to do it now, but can you send me some uh, examples of sure. where that's sure. happened? A characteristic of public sector, local, state, and federal is its limited resources compared to the private sector. This means a project upgrading public sector buildings may not be as profitable as a private construction project. And without incentives such as federal grants driving investment in public sector buildings, our municipal buildings will only decline further in quality and efficiency, resulting in lower quality services and quality of life for our constituents. And I know in parts of my district and some parts, uh, I represent the south suburbs, south side of Chicago, south suburbs, and I know particularly in some of the south suburban towns, they just simply cannot afford it. Uh, they just can't. I, as such, I'm not as confident, I guess, as you are in the ability of private sector alone to drive the market for green construction. So making the public buildings in our community more energy efficient has numerous benefits, as you know. It makes our buildings healthier and safer places to work 
by eliminating drafts and improving indoor air quality. Energy efficiency work creates good paying jobs for local workers, which I know is very important to our chairman, uh, workforce development, and to me. It's a win-win for communities across the country, and the federal government should be providing more support to bolster these efforts. And with that, I yield back. I want to thank the general lady for yielding back. The chair recognizes now uh, Mr. Hudson from North Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, the chairman, and thank you to both the witnesses for being here. I know it's a long day for you, but uh, it's very informative for us. Uh, Mr. Campos, thank you uh, in particular for being here today. Um, I want to focus on H.R. 1315, uh, the blue collar to green dollar, dollar collar jobs development act and uh, the workforce development programs within the Department of Energy. Uh, workforce development uh, should be a truly nonpartisan issue. As you may know, I've been a sponsor of similar legislation which passed with unanimous consent in prior Congresses. Um, however, I have serious concerns with this new draft. Uh, even though I was a previous sponsor, I was cut out of the drafting of this process. Uh, and, and because new language has been added, I fear we'll unfairly pick winners and losers at the expense of consumers and workforce trainees. Uh, Mr. Campos, what's the Department of Energy's vision for energy workforce development, and do you agree that it would be short-sighted to limit workforce development and training opportunities to so-called green-collar jobs only? Thank you, Mr. Congressman. I think that uh, the DOE at large uh, has interwoven workforce development uh, within its uh, many different elements and within my office. It's an important aspect for the growth of our country and our national security, so I I'm a uh, advocate on doing whatever it's necessary to promote that and to work within the confines of whatever uh, ends up happening with this bill and, and so forth. And, and if I may, the, uh, the, the department of, as a whole is very supportive of, wor of workforce uh, development. Um, there are obviously some areas where there needs to, uh, that it is a more of a critical issue, for example, around nuclear energy, for example where you have uh, the, the nuclear fleet is uh, declining in size over time, and if you do not have people, they sure. can Well, I understand that, but I, I mean, my question is, if we're only looking at green collar jobs, are we leaving out a lot of other jobs in the future that we ought to be training for? It, that, that, is, uh, that is certainly possible because of jobs in uh, you know, the oil and gas sector in particular. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Campos, I understand that the majority requested technical assistance from the department and the uh, DOE expressed several concerns. However, it does not appear that any of the suggested improvements have been made. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the Department of Energy's technical assistance document be included in the hearing record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Campos, <clears throat> I'm concerned about the price tag also of H.R. 1315. Uh, the bill amends the Department of Energy Organization Act to create a new program office with an authorized authorization of $500 million. It authorizes a new $100 million training program, and it creates a new $350 million energy workforce grant program limited to energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, it sounds a lot like President Obama's green jobs program. Um, does the Department of Energy need additional legislative authority or money for green collar job grants? Mr. Congressman, I'll have to uh, work with my staff and get back to you on that. One, uh, we are we are spending money in certain ways uh, that on, on things that you could call green uh, green collar. For example, the uh, the solar office uh, recently put out a thirteen million dollar uh, funding opportunity announcement specifically on solar workforce, um, and there's a number of other um, th there's a there's a number of other opportunities um, and uh, efforts going on bes besides that currently. Great. Um for either witness, is there a risk that this bill adds new layers of dupli duplicative programs? If you're already able uh, to focus on green collar jobs, are we are we duplicating efforts here? I'd ask either witness. I would have to get back to you on that. I'm not I'm not familiar enough with with all the language to to make a a good answer. Mr. Campos, my office will also get back to you, sir. I'd appreciate that. Um, you know, Mr. Chairman, I'm, uh, you and I are friends. I trust you and respect you, and, and, and we've worked together in the past, and, and I'd love to find a way to, to work together going forward. I just have a lot of concerns about this draft uh, and this legislation, and, uh, and I appreciate you giving me a chance to, to talk about some of those. Well, the Chair is eager to work with you. You've been my friend, and we worked together uh, in the past, and I look forward to working together with you again in, in the future. Uh, 
uh, and we will clear up any uncertainties and ambiguities that exist regarding um, the, the bill. Uh, I think there's a misunderstanding of what the chair uh, is means by blue to green color. It's not excluding any particular um, characterization of, of, uh, of jobs that are available in, a, in the energy sector. But uh, and so I look forward to working with you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from. No, he did. You recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Kennedy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you and the committee and our witnesses from the Department of Energy. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being here today. As we've seen so far, expanding uh, energy efficiency is an incredibly important piece of the fight to lessen our dependence on fossil fuels and reduce emissions. I'm proud to offer a bill along with my colleague Greg Stanton of Arizona to help municipalities achieve their goals of lessening a carbon footprint. The Energy Efficiency and Con Conservation Block Grants Program was authorized as part of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 and later funded as part of the stimulus in 2000. And it's Mr. Beasley. Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong seat. Forgive me. Um, the uh, energy efficiency and clean energy technologies are critically important to ensure a livable future. In addition to the environmental and economic benefits, they have the potential to be some of the fastest growing job opportunities, particularly in my district of southeastern Massachusetts. Last month, we heard from a panel of industry experts and business owners that they can't find enough workers uh, with the right skill sets to fill the jobs that they needed in a clean energy economy. I specifically asked about offshore wind, and our witnesses agreed offshore wind is coming, and we don't have a trained workforce ready. That's not just about jobs working directly in the industry, but also about the supply chain aspects uh, that are on the cusp of providing an economic boom in the United States. We have heard from many groups eager to provide the training and education necessary for this generation of workers. For example, at Bristol Community College, Mass Maritime, and UMass Dartmouth, they all recently signed a memorandum of understanding last June to help develop wind curriculum. Several European-based wind companies have set up American headquarters in Boston over the course of the past six months. And recently, Tufts University announced the creation of the first graduate program for offshore wind in the U.S. focused on structural and geotechnical engineering. We have an enormous opportunity sitting right in front of us to create a new energy, a new American industry and become world leaders in offshore wind. With that framework in mind, I'd like to discuss how the Department of Energy and the Congress can work together to establish the building blocks necessary for this program to succeed. I'm here today to support Chairman Rush's bill, H.R. 1315, Blue Collar to Green Collar Jobs Development Act of 2019. This legislation would ensure that we are training our workforce for new jobs in clean energy, as well as connecting trained people to employment opportunities, especially for underrepresented and underserved populations at the heart of this bill. So Mr. Campos, to begin with, as I've mentioned, offshore wind is coming to Massachusetts, and this provides an exciting new set of job opportunities. How can we make sure that Massachusetts and the surrounding area is ready for those jobs? Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, um, Congressman Kennedy. That, that's vitally important, and all sectors of, of the U.S., including the sector that you reside in, are important. What we're doing as an office is increasing an initiative we have called Equity and Energy. And I spoke to that a little earlier in my uh, opening statement. And we're engaging with various universities, community colleges, um, groups, associations, to engage in those conversations and then increase participation within those stakeholders, including uh, industry, including areas of workforce development, um, and, and also including prison reentry. So we're working with all these groups to come to a better realization and for a better edification within my office and the department in, in addressing those concerns in renewable energy. Uh, so uh, I appreciate that. I, I, would just note that I went to the webpage for the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity to look at the equity and energy program that uh, you talked about in your opening statement. The webpage says uh, site under construction. So uh, I just hope that uh, you're able to put some more information there soon as we try to make some investments to try to guide some of that, the potential there going forward. Uh, absolutely, Congressman Kennedy. We actually uh, just started this new initiative about three months ago. And so it is under construction, but we're actually working towards this. Appreciate and it, I'll sir. get your office and information as soon as it comes out. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rush's bill allows for the DOE to uh, provide direct assistance to apprenticeship, pro excuse me, apprenticeship programs, labor organizations, state and local workforce development boards. Do you think that it would be a helpful way to train and prepare our workforce for jobs in the future as they materialize across the country like offshore wind? Either one of you. Through apprenticeship programs? 
Yeah, I mean, the basic idea, trying to take some of those federal programs work locally, where we've got a, an enormous opportunity, uh, particularly in southeastern New England, with some economically challenged communities to try to put this on the forefront of an emerging industry. So I want to figure out how you all are viewing that as a potential area of cooperation. Um, unless I'm mistaken, I don't, I don't think we have, the administration has a position on, on that uh, specific aspect. Um, one, of the, one of the things with offshore wind is that, uh, that my office is working on is, is working on driving down the cost so that we can uh, be able to, um, you know, uh, realize the, the potential that there is by, by having lower cost devices, but it, it's not enough to just have the devices. You also need to have people that understand how to, how to install them. And so um, it, it sounds like that there's a lot of good opportunity. There's, there's a lot of good activities going on as with some of the things that you mentioned to make sure that there is a, a trained workforce that can actually uh, in, in, uh, install these uh, machines offshore. I'm over time, sir. I just want to, we've got a tremendous opportunity to actually incubate and grow an industry that does not exist. Um, it's going to need cooperation from federal, state, and local governments. And, Texas, I think, has, and the Secretary has a record of showing, of growing a wind industry in, in Texas that I think some lessons there could be applied valuably to a new industry as well. So I look forward to working with you guys as we move forward. Yield back. Now I recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panel for being here. Mr. Simmons, uh, DOE's Weatherization Assistance Program provides money to states who distribute the funds to support low-income residents by conducting energy efficiency audits and weatherizing homes. Uh, over the years, concerns have been missed, uh, raised about the administration of the program and its uh, influence on state energy policy. Uh, the program has continued to receive funding, but Congress has not reauthorized it since it expired in 2012, as you know. In your testimony while discussing the weatherization assistance program, you mentioned that, uh, and I quote, utility programs across the country have recognized and adopted the Home Energy Professional Certification Program. Uh, you noted that the administration is not seeking any funding for the weatherization assistance program, but the bill before us contemplates reauthorizing a significant grant program with additional funding. And so has DOE asked for this funding? Uh, and can you please talk about how your office and the federal government works with states on implementing the program? So uh, the first part of the question, we have not asked for the funding. Um, the, we work, um, we have the, the, weatherization, um, the weatherization assistance program um, office that focuses on both the state energy program and the, the, the weatherization program and making sure that that the money goes out the, the the money goes out the door the money that is appropriated by Congress um, and especially on weatherization that 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 those funds are um, we fund training uh, to make sure that the funds are spent in ways that uh, that, that make sense that you have quality installers uh, that you have quality installation so that the uh, low income families are really receiving the benefit of of these federal dollars um, those are those are a couple of the ways that uh, um, that you know we we have oversight of the money, but it is also important to make sure that the money goes out to the various states. Along those lines, uh, what do you see as a role here for EERE with regard to what the states are doing? Uh, there is a, uh, I think that there is an important oversight role that, uh, that, that we need to play to make sure that the money gets spent in ways that are consistent with federal law. Appropriate, um, efficient, and... Appropriate, efficient, um, and that the money get, and, and that the money is really going to the uh, to, to the people as specified by Congress, and it's producing quality benefits for them. Does the department um, view that the weather, weatherization program is really needed? Well, we, the, the administration doesn't have a, doesn't take a position on, 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 on that. The, the budget request is, uh, is zero for the office. Um, we also understand where, where Congress is, and we, uh, so that money, a substantial amount of money is appropriated every year, and so we work very diligently to meet our statutory obligations and to carry out the, and to carry out the program. Um, I guess uh, with that in mind, uh, would, would you commit here to uh, providing technical drafting assistance 
uh, yes, sir. for this bill. Yes, sir. Uh, so it does meet any concerns about making sure the program is viable, the program is necessary, the program functions well, and we're not wasting dollars. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Simmons, as, as you know, the subcommittee recently examined EERE's proposed process rule. At the hearing, you committed to following the statutory process to clear the backlog, which I applaud. Um, but I was also struck by the logic of the proposed rule, which sought to prioritize those rules that might return the most bang for the buck uh, in energy savings, more specifically half a quad. Um, with regard to the legislation before us today, would you like to see the similar logic included in weatherization assistance program or other proposed grant programs providing support for energy efficiency retrofit uh, should the legislation move forward? Um, we, we don't have a position on that. Um, that said, it, it would be, metrics are helpful. Would it provide ERE more flexibility? Um, I would have to hear from the experts in the program office on that um, if it would provide us with more flexibility. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, you the chair now recognizes the gentleman from the great state of California, Mr. McNerney. I thank the chairman. Um, yes, all, all of our states are great, aren't they, Mr. Chairman? Okay. Uh, I might be the last person asking you questions this morning. Well, you're the greatest. <laughs> um, I appreciate the bipartisan nature of the hearing this morning. All the bills we are looking at are, are bipartisan, and that, that's a good sign. Uh, energy efficiency is a fast-growing field, and it's creating good jobs. In particular, the Smart Energy and Water Efficiency Act of 2019 that I introduced with my colleague, Mr. Kissinger, is on the agenda today. <clears throat> Excuse me. It establishes a pilot program toward grants to demonstrate advanced energy, um, innovation, technology-based solutions for water and energy efficiency, including improved energy efficiency of water, wastewater, and water reuse systems, supporting the installation of advanced automation systems and improved conservation quality and predictive maintenance through interconnected technologies. Mr. Simmons, thank you for speaking out on energy efficiency and renewable energy program. I appreciate what you said about the water security grant challenge. Are there any resources being devoted to prizes, uh, R&D, and public-private partnerships for that program? Uh, th there will be, <coughs> yes. Can you have but, some idea what they might look like? They are, uh, the, they're, they're currently in development, so we don't have, uh, so we, um, so we don't have what they are currently, but uh, th there's definitely the, the issue of, of water, uh, both water reuse in terms of produced waters from oil and gas development, for example, but also for resource recovery from wastewater. Those are two of the important topics that we are, that we are looking at. Um, so you, you can make uh, wastewater um, more valuable than, than just a- Sure, any just idea when they'll have those uh, um, ready to announce? I don't. Uh, hopefully, we'll have something in the next few months. Well, you mentioned that water produced from the energy sector is being transformed from waste into a resource. One of the challenges are the chemicals that are introduced in this process. Is EERE committed to reducing f the freshwater requirements used in fracking and cleaning up wastewater that's produced, produced by fracking for safer use? So, um, you know, the, the uh, in that grand challenge, we're working across the Department of Energy. So that, in in, in terms of fracking, that is really the office of uh, fossil energy. Um, but uh, as I so as I understand, their uh, what what uh, you know their their goal is definitely to use less fresh water to be able to to do fracking in a in a more a water efficient manner, and then to be able to so that when the when the when the produced water comes out, for that water to have a much more wider. Um, uses, for example, maybe agriculture, rather right. than just having to dispose of it in deep injection wells. Well, well good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, is your office employing or intending to employ any uh, artificial intelligence technology to improve water energy efficiency and predictive maintenance? I would, uh, I would say that that rings a bell, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I would have to look into that. Okay. It seems to me there's a lot of opportunity there. 
Uh, there, is, uh, there, there are a lot of opportunities around uh, the managing of complex systems, such as a wastewater treatment plant um, and, uh, and AI. The, uh, the Department of Energy is home to the fastest computers in the world, um, and obviously we have a lot of experts who um, look at that. And so any time that we can uh, use various parts of the various parts of the administration or various parts of DOE can work together on an issue, um, we are uh, we very much try to do that. Mr. Campos, I apologize. I missed your opening statement and uh, the questions that may have come to you. But I'm very concerned about uh, the sort of retirement of folks that are qualified to work in energy systems and in water systems, both. Do you have any uh, trend lines of, of the number of people that expect to retire in the next decade and the number of people that are coming into the system to replace those people? Mr. Congressman, overall, I don't have those numbers, but uh, I share your concern. There is an, an aging uh, population in all energy sectors across the board, and we are addressing those within our scope of, uh, of work, but there is a, uh, there is a, a point of um, concern there for sure, and I, and I share that. And you're, I mean, you're reaching out, or you're uh, giving guidelines to re for these agencies to reach out to communities uh, across the spectrum to get in people. I mean, these are pretty good paying jobs that we're talking about, right? And they're good careers. They should be attractive to folks. Yeah, that's one of my, my priorities is to get out there within different areas of the United States and to reach and to provide that information because you're absolutely right. These are good paying jobs. And, I, and there's a lack of information and awareness towards this. And that's one of my priorities. Are, are we requiring college educations for most of these positions in your opinion? This is a, a mix, that's why in, in my equity and energy, we're doing STEM aptitude, which doesn't necessarily need college degrees. So it, it's a variety, and we're, we're seeing more and more that it's, it's certificate-based, not so much a four-year or two-year degree needed in many of these areas. All right, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks, and gentlemen, for yielding back. Uh, this concludes the uh, questions and answers segment of the hearing, and I certainly want to thank the uh, witnesses for your appearance today before the subcommittee, and I look forward to uh, having you once again to appear before this subcommittee in the near future. So thank you for your time. The chair now entertains a uh, unanimous consent request to enter into the record uh, various letters uh, and documents uh, including a letter from the National Community Action Foundation, a letter of support for and from the American Association of Blacks in Energy as it relates to H.R. 1315, uh, a letter of support from the American Gas uh, Association in support of the Homes Act, and April 21, uh, 2011 GAO report on the energy efficiency and conservation block grant program, uh, a DOE technical assistance uh, comments on HR 1315, a letter from the U.S. Green Building Council, a letter of support uh, for HR 1315 from the Solar Energy Industry Association, a letter of support from the, uh, of HR 1315 from New Energy, a letter of support from the Alliance to Save Energy uh, in support of HR 1315, a letter of support uh, in, uh, uh, for HR 1315 from the building performance industry, and an article from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, seeing no objections, uh, the uh, uh, unanimous consent request is, uh, is, is approved. And uh, seeing that there are no more witnesses and no more members to ask questions, the chair would now would adjourn this subcommittee and thank you once again for your appearance. The, uh, 
I must I'm remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. I ask each witness to respond promptly to any, sub, any such questions that you may receive. And at this time, the subcommittee stands adjourned.